started. I'm informed that Congressman kind of Brady is just a few minutes away, so uh, he'll be joining us uh, shortly. And when he does, I'll just run and stop and have uh, here some his, uh, his remarks. And then we'll uh, anyway, welcome uh, to this event. Uh, I'm Rob Atkinson, the president of ICIF. We're to an event where we're releasing a new report today for number 27. U.S. lags behind in our tax credit generosity. And uh, we're really pleased to have uh, join us today uh, Evan Linyard, who uh, you may or may not know, but Evan is really one of the leading R&D tax credit policy experts in Washington. Uh, he now we recently joined Urban Swirsky and Associates, which is a D.C. Uh, tax advocacy firm. But that was after a stint of more than 20 years as senior tax policy advisor to Senator Warren Hatch, uh, who, as you all know, is the ranking Republican on Senate Finance. And uh, he was also Senator Hatch, was uh, also the director. Uh, he also has an extensive substantive background in tax policy. Uh, he took a three year hiatus from the bill to be a partner uh, in legislative tax practice at KPMG's national office. Uh, and he received his uh, master's degree in taxation uh, from American University. Uh, and he also teaches a tax policy class uh, at American as well. So he's really a, a long-time expert, both on the, uh, the accounting theory, the tax theory behind the credit, and certainly on the political and legislative aspects of that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, when Congressman Brady comes, I will introduce him. Uh, so we've been working, uh, I tell you, I've been working on the analyzing and writing about the R&D credit now for six, five or six years. And, uh, and what we've watched is the credit uh, in the U.S. Uh, evolve slightly. A few years ago, we adopted a provision called the Alternative Simplified Credit. So as you all know, the original credit was established in 1981, which is a credit of 20% on the uh, it's an incremental credit, so it's a credit of 20% on the amount that you increase your R&D over a particular base period. I won't go into the details unless you want more information on that. That was seen as a problematic credit because some companies shifted their R&D and had different base periods. And so in 2006, Congress created what's called the Alternative Simplified Credit, which is a credit uh, essentially with a three-year rolling base period. So you take the average of your R&D as a company over the last three years, and then you get a credit of time 12% of all of your R&D uh, above 50% of your base. So if you did a million dollars in R&D uh, over the last three years, on average, if you did a million dollars the next year, you would get a credit of 12% of $500,000. So 50% of a million is $500,000. Uh, and then a couple of years after that, Congress expanded the ASC to 14%, which is where it stands today. Now, I think what's interesting is if you look at uh, the evolution of the R&D credit, we were the first country in the world to establish an R&D credit back in 1981. And we did it largely because, well, for two reasons. We did it, one, because we were at the time seen as, inten and as in intense competition uh, with the Germans and the Japanese. And that was the, they were the China of the day, if you will. And we put in place a large array of policies back then, buy and dole, protect, transfer, a whole, a whole set of policies. And the R&D credit was one of those policies that we responded with. Uh, and the second reason we did it was because there was a growing consensus among economists, uh, which is uh, still there today, that companies will underinvest in R&D uh, because there are big, what economists call spillovers. So if you, uh, if you think about that for a minute, uh, a company does some research and they invent uh, a new drug or they invent a, a new kind of a laser or a new kind of display. Uh, and it's not as if they then get all of those benefits. They can lock those up, even with patenting, even with trade secrets and copyright and all. Those benefits of those discoveries leak out, if you will, it's what economists call spillover. And so the evidence suggests that the spillovers are actually quite, quite large. Uh, one study looked at uh, 20 prominent innovations and found that the median return for an individual company who was doing the R&D was 27%. But the overall return to society, in other words, all of the benefits to other companies, was 99%. Uh, another study by, uh, by Bloom, Shankman, and Von Van Rienen uh, the Nick Blooms out of Stanford now, 
And he found that spillovers from R&D uh, were so large that while firms that do more R&D, it raised their stock price, it also raised the stock price of other firms in the industry who weren't doing the R&D. So you have these big spillovers, uh, which means that essentially the markets uh, will underperform and not do an adequate amount of R&D. We will under-innovate. And so that was really the logic at the time behind getting uh, an R&D credit. What, um, what's happened over the years, though, is that we had, uh, obviously in 1981, we had the most generous credit in the world because we were the only ones with it. And as time evolved, uh, other countries looked at us and looked at the credit and recognized that they were in intense competition to win in innovation, uh, which is the title of our book coming out in September, Innovation Economics, the Race for Global Advantage. And so they started putting in place a wide array of incentives, cutting their overall corporate rate, expanding science funding, training engineers, but also putting in place the R&D credit. So by the mid-90s, we'd fallen under under 10th place, uh, OECD, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, had us to 23rd a few years ago, and then in this new study we find that we're falling to 27th. Now, one important part of it, I won't go into too much detail on it, but one of the reasons we did this study, and I want to thank my colleagues Luke Stewart and uh, JSEC Wardwa. Um, JSEC, no, no, JSEC is a, is a tax policy expert who basically was tasked by the OECD for the last Oh, 10 or 15 years to produce the OECD R&D tax credit rankings. And so that was really kind of the definitive bible that people look at. They look at the OECD every two years, they put a report, and, and one of the things that listed in the report was uh, what countries are doing in R&D tax generosity. And in that report, they used a, the JSEC uh, developed a methodology called the B-index. And what the B-index is, is essentially a number that says, if I'm going to at the margin, invest in R&D in a country, uh, the amount of money in R&D, uh, will I get, what kind of tax benefit will I get? Uh, and so the larger the B index, the bigger the tax benefit. Now that is actually the best way to measure R&D tax credit generosity, R&D tax incentive generosity. But unfortunately, the last Two last years, and the OECD changed their methodology. They abandoned the B index, uh, partly because they thought it was too complicated, and they went to a different, uh, much more simpler model. Uh, and this is important because it, 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 you may get a, a sense from other people, well, the OECD says we're doing better than, than ITIS says. But the OECD's new model is, is essentially they add up all the money, the, the, if you will, the tax expenditures in a country from the R&D credit. So we know in the U.S. the tax expenditures are seven billion, something like that. Big number, less than 100 and more than one. Uh, it's always unclear exactly what the number is, but they basically OECD goes around. They add that number up, and then they divide that by the GDP. Uh, and so you get essentially R&D tax expenditures divided by GDP. And on that ranking, the U.S. actually looks somewhat better. It looks like it ranks 15th instead of 27. Or actually, 20th, 20th uh, in OECD. But the problem with that methodology is it doesn't really measure, it measures two things. It measures the RD tax incentive, and it also measures how much RD we're actually doing. So the fact is, the US actually does more RD than a lot of other countries because of our historical legacy of having a great science system. So we do a lot of RD, and if you put those two things together, the amount of RD we do times the incentive, you get a bigger number. You could have another country that has a really great incentive, uh, but it doesn't have as much uh, R&D in companies there aren't as developed in R&D, and it would look like its tax incentive is worse than ours. So that's why what we, we enlisted uh, the help of JSEC uh, this year to, to reinstate essentially the B-index, because we think the B-index is a much more, uh, a much more accurate measure. So one of the problems that we have uh, when, when we talk to folks on the Hill, uh, we hear a lot like, you know, do you really, really need the company really need the credit? Because you know, are you really telling me that Intel would stop its R and D if they didn't have an R and D credit, or that Pfizer would try to discover new drugs without an R and D credit? Uh, this is just corporate welfare, isn't it? And again, there's three there's three responses to that. One is what I just said before about spillovers. Sure, Intel will continue. R&D and 
Pfizer and Ford Motor Company and all the other companies that do R&D in this country. They just won't do as much. Uh, the second answer to that is that uh, economists have studied the R&D credit for over two decades. And there's a very clear consensus. You don't really get consensus in economics very much. But in this particular case, you get almost 100% consensus that when you look at the, when you study the R&D credit from an econometric perspective, in other words, big models, U.S. economy, other kind, you find that the R&D credit actually does stimulate more R&D, and the numbers vary between anywhere between a dollar per dollar. So for every dollar of tax expenditure from the credit, uh, it stimulates a dollar R&D within a company to as much as two dollars and sixty-three cents. So somewhere between a dollar and two dollars and sixty-three cents. Uh, if you don't have that credit, you would have less uh, R&D in this country by anywhere between 8 to uh, sort of 25 million billion dollars. The second, the third thing on that though is I think it misses the point of it. When people say, well, these companies will still do R&D, let's just assume that's right for a second. Let's just assume it has no effect on the overall volume of R&D. It has a big effect on the location of R&D, and that's new. Uh, a decade ago, U.S. companies didn't do that much R&D outside the U.S. Uh, R&D wasn't really globalized. You know, production might be globalized, but R&D wasn't. That's changed dramatically. In the last decade, the, according to the uh, uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis, U.S. companies have expanded their R&D 0.7 times faster outside the U.S. than all companies, foreign and domestic, have expanded R&D inside the U.S. So what's happening is they're growing their R&D outside the U.S. So it's not just production that we're losing. We're losing R&D outside the U.S. That's one of the reasons why R&D has grown slowly uh, as a share of GDP here over R&D. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that these other countries have much more generous R&D tax incentives. So again, there have been a number of different studies on the R&D credit more recently that look at this location effect. And what they find is that the R&D credit not only stimulates more R&D, it changes where it's being done. So that's, I think, another a kind of a new, a newish element, if you will, as to why it's so important uh, to have a, a good R&D tax credit. Yeah. So let me jump into the, into the results. Um, as I said, we've, uh, we've reestablished this, this B index, and uh, I've found a number of, uh, I think, uh, uh, really interesting findings. And that is actually a great segue into uh, Really, uh, uh, just finishing up the, the overview and about to get to the findings, so uh, thank you for joining us. So I know your time is uh, valid, I appreciate you joining us, so I'm going to get all the you and if you can make I'll be, I'll be very brief. One, uh, can I introduce you first? Sir? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. No, but, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, not everybody may know most of it. Uh, Carson Kevin Brady, who's a, a representative from the 8th District of Texas. Uh, he's also the Vice Chairman of the Joint Economic Committee. Uh, he's Deputy Whip for the GOP Leadership Team and also a senior member of House Ways and Means. Uh, and uh, in this context, uh, uh, Carson Brady and, and also Carson John Larson co-sponsored a, a very important piece of legislation, H.R. 942. Uh, which expands the alternative simplified credit from 14 to 20 percent, which is something we call for, uh, and then model how, if you did that, how many jobs would be created in the U.S., how many more patents, how much more R&D, and why that's important, and also to make the credit permanent. Uh, so we're really, really pleased uh, that Congressman Brady will join us. Thanks, Rob. Thank you very much. Steve, thanks for uh, putting this together as well, and thanks for your leadership on this. The, you know, the, the hard truth is uh, America's falling farther and farther behind in a key area, encouraging research and development, uh, which America was the pioneer on the incentives in 1981 when we created the R&D tax credit. Now our global competitors are taking a page from our plan and beating us soundly uh, with it. In more, and in this report short, shows more and more countries have figured out, you know, luring uh, research and development and brings not only some of the brightest minds to your country, but the innovation, the patents, and the technology edge that drives the economy, your economy in the 21st century. Our competitors know this, and more and more countries recognize this. The fact that we've now fallen to 27 ought to be a wake-up call in Congress to uh, increase 
the research and development tax credit uh, to modernize it and to make it uh, permanent. We also know that part of this effort also is uh, creating a tax system that allows us to compete around the world as well, uh, regardless of whether you're manufacturing agriculture, service, technology, and R&D, uh, and, and the role that plays in it, we ought to be able to compete. And so uh, I appreciate ITIF for conducting the study, and I appreciate, Rob, you shining the spotlight on this important weakness. Uh, and I know, you know, we oftentimes say that technology companies as, as major R&D uh, uh, entities, uh, but in the, in the Houston region, for example, I can't tell you how many oil and gas and energy companies have uh, identified these uh, remarkably lucrative R&D packages that they get from other countries, according, you know, that location. And uh, and at some point, it's going to be tough to hear, tell shareholders, no, we can't accept those incentives. So this is really a wake-up call for America Act now to get us back in the game uh, on R&D incentives. So again, thank you for all that you're doing. Um, if you don't mind, we're actually doing a hearing on uh, um, manufacturing and the tax code as well. So I'm going to scoop that with your permission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. that was a great segue into, into the, the actual results. Um, uh, so, when you look at the, uh, the index, what we found was that, as I said, you know, the U.S. is falling behind, but it's the magnitude by which we're falling behind that's interesting. Uh, and also some of the countries that are really leading right now. I mean, the big surprise does India is the leading country in the world. If you want to have the best incentives to get R&D done, go to India. Now, you know, one thing if this were, you know, Mongolia or something, no offense if anybody's Mongolian either, but, uh, you know, I don't think Mongolia has a lot of scientists and a lot of engineers, but India has a great scientific and engineering base. They've got a lot of really, really talented scientists and engineers. They've got these high-tech clusters in various places like uh, uh, Mumbai and Chennai and, and other places. And they've got low wages, and they've got this great R&D tax incentive. So these countries are putting a lot behind winning this race. Um, France uh, right now has the second best R&D tax credit for small firms and the fourth for big firms. I mean, it's like, you have these old assumptions which are so out of date. Oh, the French, aren't they socialists? I think they are actually, but uh, leaving that aside. The French realize that this is such an intense race that they're in that they're going to lower their taxes and in particular provide these big, big incentives uh, to do R&D there. Our neighbor to the north, uh, Canada, has the fifth best R&D credit for small firms, 13th best for large firms. Uh, and when you combine that with the provinces in a, in, you go to, you go to a province like Ontario, uh, and you're a small firm in Ontario or a small firm in Quebec, you can get upwards of 60% credit on all of your R&D. Here we give you a 14% credit on half of your R&D, and there they'll give you a 60% credit on all of your R&D. Uh, Brazil, China. So it's not just kind of other rich countries that are doing this. It's a whole set of countries uh, that, if you will, are, are uh, developing countries that are under advantage. When you just look at the uh, 21 OECD countries where the data are comparable over the years, what you find is uh, for large firms, uh, we've fallen uh, in tax generosity from 9th in 1999 uh, to uh, 21st, uh, excuse me, to um, uh, to uh, uh, 13th today, and then when you look at all these countries combined, as I said, we've fallen uh, essentially uh, from about 6th uh, or so uh, for large firms, to be ninth for large firms, down to about 20 Now, if we wanted to raise our stats, we, let's say we wanted to have a real stretch goal in the US, we want to be number one, we want to have the most better credit in the world. Uh, we would have to raise the alternative simplified credit not to 20 percent but to 50 percent. Now, I'm not saying that we will do that or maybe even should do that, but that whole level of magnitude that we are facing right now, if we want to get to fifth place in the world, 
and be on par with Denmark, we would need to raise the ASC from 14 to 35 uh, percent. Just to do what um, uh, Congressman Brady and Congressman Larson have proposed to bring the ASC to 20 percent, that would uh, that would be a big important step, uh, and that would get us up to 15th place. So even doing that, which is important, and hopefully we can do it. Uh, and still, it still may not have been as far enough. Uh, the president, to his credit, has called for an expansion of the ASC, uh, uh, but just to 17%, uh, not, not as high as, as 20%. So I'll just close by saying a couple things. One is we did, we did a model uh, where we looked at the uh, econometric evidence and the impact of R&D on productivity, et cetera, and jobs. And what we found is that if we expanded the credit from 14 to 20%, that we would create uh, 160,000 new jobs, excuse me, 162,000 new jobs, direct, indirect, and induced. Uh, we would create an additional 3,800 uh, 3, patents, utility patents filed in the U.S. Patent Office. Uh, we would add $66 billion a year to GDP. And that, by the way, is only, um, that's not a dynamic effect. It's, it's really, there could be other effects from the uh, big, big, Discoveries. And uh, the interesting thing about that is the tax revenues. Uh, so everybody's like, oh, how can we afford the RD tax credit because we're in this fiscal crisis and all that? If we just extended the budget window from five years to 15 years, which I grant is a long, long time, the RD tax credit actually starts to pay for itself in net present value terms after 15 years. So it takes a while because the benefits of R&D take a while to generate new discoveries, which lead to more jobs, which lead to higher productivity, which lead to higher wages, higher incomes, and therefore more taxes. But again, according to our model, if we had a long enough window, so if you were a patient investor, which I think of all the investors in the world, the US government should be the most patient. I mean, it's like, we got a lot of time. We're not like a corporation that has to maximize its profits for its shareholders this quarter. We can afford to take the long view. If we took the long view, this would be something. And, and if we were only worried about the U.S. Treasury, we weren't worried about jobs, we didn't care about higher wages for Americans, higher incomes, better products, none of that stuff. We were just worried about the U.S. government as an enterprise, a profit-making enterprise. And we had a 15-year window of time for it. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll just close by saying I think, um, to, to me, the really interesting thing is, is going to be the fate of this incentive when we uh, come back, uh, I assume uh, we'll come back in 13 and, and take up, uh, you all will take up corporate tax reform. Uh, I think it would be a dire shame and tragedy for the R&D credit to be thrown overboard to get some ballast to lower the overall rate. If you get rid of the R&D credit, you can lower the rate uh, from 35 to 34 percent. Big deal. Uh, the R&D credit is, is so important that getting the rate down one point is not worth it. You lose so much more, uh, both in innovation and in competitiveness. So I encourage you all, when, when your bosses are thinking about that question, to you know, keep that in mind with the RD credit. I think it's one of those incentives that actually has a unique place in the tax code. So with that, I'll turn it over to Thank you. Good morning. I'm really grateful to be here today to have a chance to share my personal perspective about the research credit in today's legislative climate. I want to emphasize I'm speaking today on my own behalf. Talking about the future of the research credit is actually a bit of a challenge because of the high level of uncertainty surrounding this issue. Not that the research credit is a stranger to uncertainty, it certainly is not. However, I believe most students of the credit will agree that back in 1981, when it was born with an expiration date, it uh, had some degree of uncertainty, and that uncertainty is discontinued with its 15 expirations and extensions. So it's born with uncertainty and it's continued to live with uncertainty. I also think it's fair to say that the uncertainty surrounding the research credit has grown a great deal in recent years. Back in the good old days of the 1990s and the 2000s, the credit had its ups and downs, and many of us had one or two moments of doubt about the continuing viability of the credit and the future of it. But with those few exceptions, the extension and 
general liability of research credit was almost like clockwork. That is, if you consider a clock that is running six months to a year behind, like clockwork. The point is that the extension of the research credit, along with the rest of the expired provisions, occurred so many times that another resurrection and extension became a pretty sure bet. Ironically, the fact that the credit could not be relied upon became one of the chief rallying cries for why it should be made permanent. And the ostensible support for a permanent credit has, in my view, been a major factor leading to each new extension. I'll try to figure out the group psychology behind that. Today, however, I think the situation has shifted. The dynamics surrounding the research credit itself and the role, its role in the economy haven't changed that much. What's different is the larger legislative landscape, which has been significantly altered by the pending expiration of the 2001-2003 tax cuts, the payroll tax reduction, and all the other elements that comprise so-called tax adjustment. After this, the growing likelihood that the tax reform is on its way, which seems to offer corporate America <coughs> excuse me, the possibility of much lower tax rates. We are told, however, that these lower rates will likely come at the price of the repeal of a number of uh, so-called tax expenditures, including possibly the research credit. To complete the chaos, we see no real evidence that the usual retroactive reinstatement of the research credit is on the list of things that are likely to get done before the end of 2012. Now, to be sure, we see good faith efforts on both sides in the tax writing committees to try to take care of the extenders this year. But few believe that reinstatement of even the granddaddy of the extenders is likely before 2013. So we seem to be in, have entered into an environment where optimism and even perhaps support for the research credit, which is usually very widespread, may be in some doubt. We hear reports that this corporation or that industry may be willing to sacrifice the research credit in exchange for a 25% top tax rate. Where does that all leave us? in terms of the research credit. As we all know, it died on December 31st of last year. But it's died many times before. Is it really dead this time? Is it time to chisel rest in peace on this tombstone? I don't think it is, but I don't know for sure. But if the research credit is more of them, it shouldn't be, at least not in my view. Probably for as many years as the research credit has existed, it has enjoyed the broad support of the business community. I believe it still does, and this support has been and will continue to be very important. But even if some large key business enterprises decide that they would individually be better off exchanging the research credit for a low tax rate in tax reform, should this be a reason to allow the credit to die a peaceful death? I don't think, I don't think so. The best tax policy for the United States should not depend on whether internal calculations indicate that some companies might win under tax reform by trading things such as the research credit for a lower tax rate. This is zero-sum thinking, and it should not drive tax policy. We should be looking for the best way to maximize growth for the entire economy, the entire nation. Rather, policymakers should be looking for the same economic analyses that have always bolstered the notion that a strong tax incentive for R&D is a good thing for a nation that wants to stay, stay competitive and innovative. While the research credit has always had its detractors, there is plenty of solid evidence, as, as Rob indicated, to recommend its continued existence in the tax code. I believe the only real debate ought to be whether and how to make it permanent and even stronger than it is, so we can move up in that ranking. Well, in my mind, the most compelling of many reasons we, we need a vibrant R&D tax incentive is the fact that so many other nations now have much better ones than we do, even when ours is alive and kicking, when the research credit is hibernating like it is now and showing signs that it may never emerge from the case again, how effective can we expect it to be? Even when the research credit is resurrected for a few months or a couple of years, can we really expect it to be effective when stacked up against some of the incentives that these other nations have developed? Lower tax rates are critical to our global competitiveness, but so is innovation. This should not be an either-or proposition. 
I hope that IPIF's new report will help generate more debate about the research credit and its role in, in the modern tax system that we really should, should look to, to be creating right now and that we can stop the talk that uh, we ought to be trading some of these very, very important incentives for things like the 1% lower reduction in the tax rate. Thank you.
is losing the retroactivity. They're just not doing stuff. Things don't get in the pipeline. Um, I mean, how much longer can we go with this hibernation before you think, that's or is it already happening? That's a very good question. And under normal circumstances, when tax reform is not pending, it has kind of become the norm, and everybody expects that we're going to retroactively extend the credit. <coughs> that has been what uh, the industry has thought about as well. And so it became kind of a pseudo incentive, even though it wasn't there. But now, uh, with so much doubt about it, and particularly if we're going to 2013 and tax reform discussions, it gets a lot harder for members to justify going back and, and putting in an incentive for something that happened over a year ago. <clears throat> Under the idea that we're going to incentivize the research that took place already. And uh, I think that it, it becomes a, a, a very good question about whether or not uh, it does get made retroactive at that point and, and, and whether or not it gets restructured in something that looks much different from what it is right now. The longer this goes, I think the more the credit as we know it becomes questionable. So you guys mentioned how many times this credit has expired and how that's affected businesses. Could you talk about how if, if this was actually made permanent, you know, what could that actually do for uh, businesses in this country in terms of keeping manufacturing here and uh, especially you know, bringing more R&D and bringing more orders? I'll start with a, a couple things. <coughs> Permanency is important, but I, I'm, we've gotten to the point where I think we, you know, we just can't, we can't do permanency alone. We're so anemic in terms of this incentive. We've got to do permanency and expansion, which is what the Congressman Brady's uh, bill does. Um, there is a, some a good econometric evidence that suggests that the uncertainty, the old uncertainty, now we're in a new weird period, the old uncertainty, which was you think it's going to get renewed, that that does have a negative effect on, on the amount of R&D companies do. Not a big effect, but it does have, have, have some effect. Um, you, the point about manufacturing is important because about 75% of all corporate R&D is done in the manufacturing sector today. And uh, what we've seen, and then, then Lily Sheen here at Zano at Harvard Business School have written eloquently about this, is what we've seen is a movement uh, that starts with commodity uh, production, so we're making widgets, and we're going to move that from Poughkeepsie, we're going to move it over to uh, China, or move it to Mexico. And then we start moving kind of the next level up, the next complex product. And then we start moving R&D and design. And that's really where we're at now is some of that stuff is beginning to move. It has moved, as I've said. So I think that's really the big risk. Because once you lose that, it's pretty much game over. You, you really don't bring a lot of that stuff back. Um, so again, I, I, think we, I think we're at a, you know, the next year will be a critical inflection point. We'll, we'll decide as a country that we're going to have a competitive tax code. That, that has a real focus on innovation and competitiveness, or we won't, and I think if we won't, I think the answer will be that we'll continue to do what we've done, which is we've lost a third of our manufacturing jobs in the last decade, the highest rate of loss uh, ever in American history, even, even, even in the Depression. You know, I just can see this kind of continuing that slide. It won't be as steep as it might have been, but it's going to slide. Well, based on the discussions I had when I was on the Hill with a lot of different companies, they, they all believe that a permanent credit is going to be more effective, especially in the longer run. As I indicated in my remarks, because of the almost clockwork reliability of, of the credit being retroactively extended, in the short run it became almost a, a, a de facto a permanent credit because we're we'll be pretty well counted on it, at least for the next year. For longer projects, I, I was told by a number of companies that we really would do more if we thought that this was going to be here five years from now, three years from now. Yes. What's the practical difference between 17% the president is uh, suggesting the 20% that you see in the English language? Doesn't seem like that big of a difference. Uh, it is, uh, what is that, 14% difference or whatever it is. It's, uh, it, it, I think it is. It's not a big, big difference, but uh, the question is, is it, you know, should we go to 23? I mean, you got to essentially just pick a number. And I think the fact that there is legislation in both the House and the Senate that had picks the number 20, as I said, I'd go to 30. I'd go to 35. But I, there doesn't seem to be the political appetite to do that big a lift right now. So I think uh, you know, going, going to 20, I think, is a, is a 
much better. I mean, to, to me, you know, the, the bigger the number, the more jobs we're going to get, the more competitive we'll be, the more our, our uh, innovation based industry will do better. So that would be that'd be very good. I, I think the Obama administration just should have dipped the bullet beyond 20, um, but you know, ONP calls the shots over there, and don't worry about uh, the green eye shade uh, bottom line number. And, um, you know, if you're really serious about this stuff, you got to like pull it. I mean, again, you look at these other countries, you know, a good example is, is uh, uh, Finland. Um, Finland was in a much worse financial crisis than we were back when the Soviet Union broke up. I mean, like three times worse. Three times worse. Three times higher unemployment. Three times fiscal hit. Uh, and the first thing they did, it was uh, they cut the corporate tax rate and they expanded the money to fund funding for science and technology. So they just, you know, they just bit the bullet. They didn't need to do it. And I think we're in exactly the same yeah, the same boat. I don't think we have the luxury of just you know, going to 17. I think mean, we've got to take bigger steps. In a way, I think we have to have almost shock therapy for the economy. And 17 is like a little, uh, you know, 20 is more of a panel. My question left for answer your point, and that is, oh, this is very bipartisan. There's a lot of bipartisan support for the credit and has been for a long time. The fact that the administration and Republicans and Democrats on the Hill all support the stronger credit is a very good sign. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming soon.